So tonight, we've got David Bonson on the show. David is the chief investment officer of the Bonson Group with over $4.5 billion of assets under management, and he's here with us tonight. Hi, David. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up. Well, it's wonderful to be with you. Thanks for having me. Dave, for the month of November, the stock market has been fantastic. And now that we're in the, you know, we've just finished up the first week of December, we've still got a few more to go. What do you think December looks like? Well, I think December will probably end up going the way the bond market goes. If, if interest rates drop further, stock market could go higher still. Um, and if interest rates were to reverse and move higher, it may cool the rally a little bit. But those hoping for a significant move higher still, I don't see that in the cards. It's very difficult to predict something for two or three week period. But this rally from kind of late October all the way through November, it was so substantial that I think uh, investors would be wise not to be uh, overly spoiled right now. Dave, do you t put any any credence to the thought that, you know, there was a thought that the December before the presidential election year, next year's presidential election, and the, the December is, I don't know if it's always up or usually up. Do you put any credence to that? I do not. And it is true that it is usually up. And there are about 100 different things, including correlations with what uh, Western or Eastern Conference team in the NBA wins the championship uh, <laughs> connecting to, to stock market returns. And so a lot of those things I don't believe have enough causation for us to consider them to be investable. But nevertheless, there are correlations that take place over the years with the calendar. And you could argue that certain things around election years, for example, the year before an election year, um, it's been a very long time since we had a negative one in the third year of an administration. But uh, the whole thing about December before a presidential election year, there are exceptions to it. And so why invest when you may be the next exception? You know, I've, I've talked to some traders like at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Chicago Options Exchange. If they've had a good day, they keep the same shirt that they've had yeah. the same week all week. Now, you know, you're in that pit. It, it's not the best of temperatures. And I, I, I grew up in the business in the 90s, and Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair when I first began managing money, and people used to look at the size of his briefcase going into I a meeting to see. Yes. If, what about the strength of the consumer now uh, going into December? You know, this is the holiday season, Christmas time. A lot of retailers hope and pray for the last month of the year to get back anything that they've lost for the first 11 months. Well, I'll share with viewers my kind of permanent philosophy about the consumer in America. Okay. It's always strong. The things that happen that hurt the consumer are never their appetite to consume. They are always willing to shop. They're always willing to spend money. There are just times, and they're not that many, but there are times in which they lose access to credit. Um, that's really what we're talking about in America. When we talk about a weak consumer, is simply that they've run out of money and access to money. We're nowhere near that now. Um, the savings rate is lower than I want it to be, but employment is still quite good. Wages are still quite good and that American consumer appetite, it simply doesn't go down. And when people look at consumer confidence and say, oh boy, this is foreshadowing weakness to come, it never plays out that way. And the reason is, is that consumer confidence is rear view mirror. It's how people are feeling about things they just heard, but then going forward, if they still have a job, if they still have credit, the American consumer still spends money. It's gonna be a very good holiday shopping season. Well, with more, Consumers, from what I understand and see, that they're putting a lot more on credit, on their credit cards, than as before. With unemployment, um, you know, it's, it's inching up a little bit, which is what the Federal Reserve wants to do, slow down the economy. Do you think more consumers are going to be concerned about keeping their job and also with credit? Well, we still have a quits rate, that is, which is people voluntarily leaving their job, that is higher than historical average. Um, earlier in the week, we saw in the JOLTS data, the job openings, 8.7 million job openings. That's down a couple million from where it was a year and a half, two years ago, but it's still up a couple million from a 10-year average. So there's still um, quite a bit of room in the labor data, but I also just don't believe that people are making decisions about going out to dinner or taking their family to a movie 
around what they think about their job. I think the consumer primarily uh, is intent to consume and that we have to focus our gauge of the American economy around production, not consumption. Nobody can consume until someone else is first produced. And it's production that ultimately drives economic activity. Gasoline oil has been going down lately. Do you see that oil will continue to be going in a downward trend? And, and I'm curious your thoughts. Is the reason for oil going down is because less people are, are driving right now? No, oil um, is, was about 67 to 75 for much of the year, and then it went above 80, particularly after the um, Hamas attack on Israel, and then it's come back down into the mid-70s. Um, and I think that uh, most of that is just supply-related. Uh, America's gotten its daily production up to a level at least able to hopefully try to clear the market, but they haven't refilled that strategic petroleum reserve basically at all and uh, OPEC plus is cut production. So I think it's more on the supply side. Um, and, and then on the demand side, China's weakening demand is the bigger story. There's very little evidence of any declining uh, demand on, on US oil. But basically oil prices are around where they were at the beginning of the year, down a few percent, they were up a bit. But I would say that there's much more upside risk for oil than there is downside, and that's more of a geopolitical statement. Do you find that, and it's very true like what you say about China, um, what about the United States? I mean, probably you could possibly say that uh, we're having the most anticipated recession that has never occurred. Um, do you think that we've had a slight recession in the past? We just, it was very mild. Do you still think that coming up into 2024, are we still in store for a possible recession? Well, we're, we're certainly in store for a possible recession in 2024, but I, d I most definitely do not believe we had one in 2022 or 2023. You had a stock market recession, particularly with things like crypto, and, and some of the really hot tech companies, the NASDAQ, in 2022. But if I were to say we had a recession, but nobody lost their job, wages went up, and corporate profits went up, what kind of a recession is that? Mm -hmm. It's like saying it rained when nobody got wet. It just, uh, ultimately, that's what a recession is, is a uh -huh. decline in jobs, wages, and profits. And so I don't think we had one, and I very much agree with you. It was one that everybody was expecting. In 24, what could cause a recession? It would just simply be if the lag effect of tight monetary policy that didn't cause a recession this year ends up catching up to us. Uh, and that could very well happen, but I wouldn't bet on it. I think, I think that the Fed has a chance to get out of this really quite lucky. Do you, th do you think the Federal Reserve is doing the right thing, what they're doing with each rates? And, and that would lead me to my thought of, we still have one more meeting to go for the end of this year uh, and also for next year. I think in December, there's a 0% chance, okay. zero, that they will either hike or cut. So uh, it's a foregone conclusion at the meeting coming up here in mid-December that they will do anything but pause. Um, when you ask if I think they're doing the right thing or not, and you had made the comment earlier about the Fed wants to see weakening labor conditions, right? Slow, slowly growing unemployment to quote unquote cool down the economy. That's where I disagree with the Fed. I don't believe that okay. people having jobs causes inflation. I don't believe that a quote unquote hot economy causes inflation. Inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods. And people having jobs creates more goods. You want the production of goods and services if you want to put uh, downward pressure on inflation. Um, ultimately, uh, interest rates being too low for too long distorts markets and, and creates booms that can be very unhealthy. And so I think the Fed had to raise rates to get rid of those excesses. But I do believe they've gone too high and now for too far. I think ultimately uh, they tighten credit more than enough and it's time to start loosening, and I think they'll start to do so uh, in March and April and May of 2024. I understand, and, and I agree with you, Dave. I mean, I think it was Mil economist Milton Friedman who said the consumer, the, the public, cannot create inflation. It's the government printing too much money and putting it out in the system. It's not the consumer that is, is 
doing the consuming. It's the government with the printing press. I think there was a report out that we've got about five and a half trillion, trillion with a T, money in cash sitting in money market accounts right now that is just sitting there and that's about a 27 percent increase than it was from the october before that so with all this money that's in the system in in, in cash in, in money markets do you think that this is less cash that's getting ready to get into the stock market that would rise raise the stock market or or do you think, and I've heard you talk before about bonds, treasury bonds. Let's say at treasuries, you're making 4.2% of on an interest rate on your treasury, and in CPI is, let's say, inflation is at 3.2%. The, is the investor thinking, you know what, I'll take 4.2, you subtract 3.2 from 4.2, and I get into a plus. What, what are your thoughts on, on scenarios? It's very important for people to remember that money market levels being up 25, 27% mm -hmm. um, coincides with bank deposits being down about the same. The bulk of the money is sitting on the sideline in money markets moved from one part of the sideline, bank deposit accounts, to another part of the sideline, money market funds. And the reason being people in pursuit of a higher interest rate. And so money left the banking system because they now could get more competitive rates in a money market. Um, and you're exactly right that some people say, hey, my money market's paying 5%, but I could lock it in a 10-year treasury for over 4%. Those money market rates are going to be coming way down as the Fed starts cutting rates. So people who don't want to put their money into risk assets, it's a good uh, time for them to basically pursue what we call the term premium, get a premium to lock their money up for a term, mm -hmm. three year, five year, 10 year. Well, when the yield curve is inverted, it's a negative term premium. Nobody wants that. But if the short term rates start coming down, like money markets, that longer term uh, yield will become more attractive. But I think savers have to think about that now, not after the fact, because the 10 year yields will come down. Keep in mind, you say 4.2%, which is the 10-year, um, it was 5% five, five weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So rates have already come down quite a bit. What about government debt, Dave? I mean, uh, right now, by the time we finish this interview, uh, we're just a hair at $34 trillion. By the time we finish the interview, it, it may be $34 trillion by this time, which means the government has to keep borrowing money which they sell treasury bonds to be able to finance the interest on just the debt alone. With what, we, with what you're talking about as far as the interest rates, do you see that interest may be going down from these treasuries or do you think that the government, because of debt being so high, they're gonna have to keep inducing either American buyers or foreign buyers to keep buying our, our treasuries? Well, that's exactly right. But it's very important uh, that we delineate between foreign buyers that are foreign countries mm -hmm. buying treasuries to try to um, protect their currency um, or private uh, investors and private savers in foreign countries. So if you're Mr. and Mrs. Smith in the United States of America or the Mr. and Mrs. Smith equivalent in Europe, you care about the yield. You want to buy treasury if you're getting a good interest rate. Mm -hmm. But if you're the country of England or the country of China, country of Japan, most of what you're doing with treasury bonds is just like our Fed, totally agnostic about the interest rate. You don't care. You care about what it's doing to the currency. Either you need your currency a little weaker for competitive reasons, or you need a little stronger because it was getting too weak, all of that type of stuff. That's really where we are right now. But really back to your important point you made, the cost of the debt. It is not about how many treasuries they issue, it's about the, the a portion of federal outlays going towards servicing the debt. The Fed knows this. And this why I believe interest rates are headed lower is that our overly indebted economy can't handle it. Mm. It's not about what it will do to jobs, what it will do to housing, what it will do to bank debt. I mean, all those things matter, but really I think fundamentally our own government can't afford it. And we've seen what that's done in Japan. Mm -hmm. 30 years of excessive debt, they've been running around 0% interest rates. Dave, and I think, unfortunately, we're headed to a similar predicament. Well, Dave, do you think that 
eventually it's going to catch up to us where, uh, you know, I always say that if you jump off of a 40-story building, the first 39 floors are fine. It's only at the very end. I mean, right now the market is not putting into that into effect. Do you think eventually, and, and how will we see this? Well, this is one of the most important things I talk about. It's a message that I care about as much as anything. Um, I think people should stop thinking about when they're going to hit the bottom of a sidewalk after 45 stories mm -hmm. and more think about what is happening. But it isn't dramatic. It doesn't involve a splash at the, at the bottom of the, of the fall. It's low, slow, and no growth over time. So the idea that this excessive debt has to end with a bang, sometimes it can end with a whimper and be just as bad. Japan has had no economic growth for 30 years. We can't handle that in America. The debt level itself is not my biggest concern. We grew the national debt a lot in the 80s and 90s, but as a percentage of GDP, it didn't move. Mm -hmm. Now the debt is growing at a faster pace than the economy is. That's the part we cannot bear. We have to slow down the growth of the debt and we have to pick up the growth of the economy and that buys them a lot of time. But I don't wanna do doomsday predictions when people were saying some of this 30 years ago. We were below a trillion dollars of debt when I graduated high school and Ronald Reagan was leaving office and, and people thought the same thing then. Now we have 33 times that level of debt and the can can get kicked a long time, but it can't get kicked without hurting economic growth. That's what I would focus on. What about you were talking before earlier about the Federal Reserve with them eventually next year will be lowering, possibly lowering interest rates. And normally certain stock sectors with lower rates or a trajectory of going lower do better than those that are uh, with a trajectory of interest rates going up. And I'm thinking of like technology, uh, real estate, uh, things like that. If we know, it, what are you telling your clients? If you know that you think that the, the Federal Reserve will be lowering interest rates in the foreseeable future, would you get ahead of the curve and start buying on stocks and stock sectors that would, be of, uh, that would go higher with lower rates? The, the problem is that everything you just said, the whole market already knows as well. And so when, oh, you, when, you, look, when, you, look at, when you look at big tech, that generally their PE ratios, their valuations, right, mm -hmm. that they tend to go higher when yields or bond market rates are going lower. But um, the market this year is known that's coming, and you have big tech largely trading at about 50 times earnings. So the reason why I wouldn't get in front of it is because I wouldn't be in front of it. It largely seems to me to be priced in. So what are the rate sensitive areas that have not done real well this year that I think might be better areas to put money in next year? Well, you mentioned one is uh, real estate, particularly some of the publicly traded real estate companies that are very rate sensitive. Um, utilities have been the worst performing sector this year. And then consumer staples. And I think consumer staples are probably the most attractive of the bunch because they have great pricing power. And, they, and prices have gone higher there, and as inflation levels are coming down, they're able to keep their pricing so their margins expand, and that turns into higher profits. Dave, I've heard you talk in the past about uh, you liking companies like Blackstone or Apollo or private credit. Uh, that was in the past. Are you, do you still have those type of feelings? Oh, I sure do. And uh, admittedly, they've had such an incredible year, up over 50% in some cases, uh, that we are happy to have been very right there, uh, but they're obviously not quite as cheap as they were before. But that theme is one that we believe in for years and years to come. Um, I don't think you're going to see the Silicon Valley banks and First Republic banks of the world that are no more be the major lender on certain corporate and real estate activity. Uh, asset managers like Apollo, Blackstone, there's quite a few of them. They're very, very large have access to incredible capital, but here's what I love as a taxpayer. The people taking the risk are the investors. Mm -hmm. They're risk takers. So they're gonna be doing a lot more of this private credit investing that banks are doing less and less. I think it's better for our economic system as a society, and it produces a lot of opportunity for investors. Dave, we're, we've just got a few more weeks 
before the end of the year. And if you count it down in trading days, it's, 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 it's counting down to uh, very, very few. What should a, a, an investor look at that how should they adjust or should they adjust their portfolio coming up to December 31st? Right. Well, you know, there is always late year tax loss selling. Some people may want to do, they might have a couple things in their portfolio that were down, but I don't think that there's anything magical about uh, the holiday season when it comes to an investor's long-term investing plans. And so if there's a company that you loved in November and you think you're going to love it in January, there's no reason not to love it in December. These things aren't really tradable. Um, ultimately, a good, durable, well-constructed long-term portfolio should go through the turn of a year and the happenstance of a calendar. But yeah, there's always tax loss opportunity to think about this time of year. Dave, I've got a lot more to talk to you about. I, I, I hope you come back. Well, I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me.